to uh, welcome our special guests this morning, and uh, glad to have you here with us. Uh, it's so exciting to have another Sunday to worship God. It is uh, our joy and delight. A special thanks to everyone who worked so hard and diligently with Family Promise this past week. Uh, it was um, a great great success, a great week. We didn't lose anybody, um, and we may have even gained a few uh, through that, so uh, praise the Lord. Any reflections uh, or praises for Family Promise? Yes, ma'am? I just have to praise the volunteers. I, I am so appreciative. have any reflections on uh, our week with Family Promise? Yes, ma'am. There was somebody different every night. Some people did double duty for hosts and, and contributed to some extra dinners, but there was a different uh, group sleeping every night, and that's just unusual and a blessing. Please continue to be in prayer for these families. This is a still a, a very, very difficult uh, time for them and still uh, just a, a level of chaos in their lives that I don't think we can, can fully appreciate. Praise the Lord. And um, even, even so, there have been some um, difficult situations that have arisen just the last couple of days for uh, the, the, the mom with the three kids. And uh, our hearts break for them. And we, we do the best that we can and are, are glad to be part of a large consortium of churches and, and believers in the, uh, in the community that extend themselves. And I'm with Ellen and, uh, and Elaine and saying thank you to all of you guys who came out of your your houses, your homes, your own beds that you work real hard to keep and have just the way you like them and come here to the church and spend the night uh, in uh, not the most comfortable of beds. Um, I, I'm not sure that they, if you remember the, the old Motel 6 when it was $6? It, it, it was right. You could get a you could get a, a motel room for six dollars a night. Um, this probably would have. Pardon me. They left a light on for you. They left a light on for you. That's the refrigerator light. Um, well, these beds probably were like the the buck two ninety eight. <laughs> but you did it. You did it, and praise the Lord. It was it was helpful. I also would like to uh, extend a great thanks to our youth and uh, uh, the night that they spent uh, hosting. We had that night six kids from outside the, we had six kids in the host family that were not related to this church. And so, whereas none of the families showed up for youth night, we had six kids there that fit into the, the youth group and got to play and, and have fun, and it was it was just a great thing. And to see Amanda crowding all those kids, about 16, 18 kids, it just really wore me out. <laughs> she did an excellent job, and we're very grateful. There are some uh, announcements in your bulletin. Uh, 
if you will, uh, please remember our um, international worker kids. That just doesn't sound as good as missionary kids. But uh, please be thinking of them uh, and how we might be able to uh, celebrate and help them in their birthdays and in this Christmas season. Choir rehearsal tonight at 5 o'clock. And, uh, and then uh, next Saturday, is that right, Ellen? Yes. Okay. Um, just because we're a, 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 a friendly and kind and intimate group, and, and I have uh, no muffler at all uh, when it comes to this, um, the ladies that Ellen is sitting with are the Choir director and uh, and, and assistant director, and assistant director. Up north. <laughs> yeah, from all the way brought in from the forward <laughs> lines uh, over at Oxford College, and uh, so this is the this is the choir, the music, uh, the mavens of of uh, of the world. <laughs> and so I say uh, that our, our choir rehearsal of our 500 voices. Will be <laughs> I can get in trouble for lying like that, can I? Mm -hmm. yeah. Potentially 500. Potentially. <laughs> but we have uh, added a bunch of male voices, which really sound good. So we're, but we're thrilled to have you guys with us today. Thank you. Really, really Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, wait till you listen to us sing. Oh, you can lead us. <laughs> yes, Deb. Good point. Uh, December calendar, a cantata next Sunday, uh, the 15th at 6 o'clock. Bring finger foods and fellowship uh, following the cantata. And then again, uh, next week we'll have a, a special rhythm, rhythm to have a congregational meeting during the Sunday school hour, so 9.30. If you would, look around and see who's not here and call them up this week and tell them that... Uh, that, uh, that, that we'll be meeting at 9.30. That they'll want to be here. Uh, so somebody be sure and call Glow and Steffi. Are they st they're going to be back? Does anybody know? Yeah. We don't know. Did they move? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but call Glow and Steffi. Uh, Shirley knows, but somebody can call her. Uh, David and Laura know. Um, and they're out of grandkids. Bert and Joan probably won't be back. Uh, they're in Florida, and I think everybody knows this, but Bert is in the hospital um, with a, 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 an infection that's pretty serious, uh, but uh, Robin, their daughter, is going to fly down next Friday, pick them up, and uh, drive them back um, so they'll have their, their vehicle back up here. Uh, so that's the theory next Friday. We're hoping that uh, but, but we don't expect to see them. Uh, Betty and Jenny. thank you, uh, and Jenny have both uh, fallen this past week, and so uh, be in prayer for them. But we're hoping that they'll be they'll be back. And I'm just not seeing anybody other than uh, Noel's mom. Uh, that just encourage everybody to to be here next week for at at nine thirty um, for the. Uh, Congregational meeting. Are there any other announcements? Yes, sir. I have a new list for special requests for the food pantry. They're asking for boxed cereal, boxed spaghetti, spaghetti sauce, canned chili, and jelly. Also, uh, we've got three more weeks before the end of the year to bring in our can offering, and I forgot to set the basket out this uh, uh, this week, but remember, we did real good a couple of weeks, and I think everybody like me kind of started to forget, but just in, in uh, solidarity with Family Promise and with the food bank, um, to uh, as a spiritual uh, discipline, if you will, to to bring something in uh, to the congregation for the food bank, uh, just as a special offering. Um, for the
the next uh, three weeks. You'll find also in the bulletin the uh, uh, prayers for the persecuted church, praying through the book of Psalms, um, listed as uh, 101 through 107, so I encourage you to be uh, in prayer for the, the church around the world as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, if the, if the deaconesses would uh, arrange that for us, we would be blessed. Thank you. Okay. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with hearts grateful. mindful of us, that you love us, and that you have sent your Son to save us. We thank you for the faith to believe and the heart to know that you are God. We ask that you would fill our hearts with your Spirit, that we might worship you. Capture us, we pray, in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling us to himself. Will you stand with me? The incarnation story starts for Luke long before the stable. words that the gospel has recorded of Jesus' mother, Mary, speaking to her cousin, recognize that she's already pregnant with the Lord. said, my soul exalts in the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has exalted those who are humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and his descendants forever. In the bleak midwinter, hymn number 103.
the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and salvation from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, hymn number 75.
first advent in Scripture uh, we might call in Genesis chapter 3, which was a, uh, a tragic first advent. Uh, we know Genesis 3 is the fall, and after the fall, Adam and Eve are uh, hiding as the Lord comes to the garden. Most translations say in the cool of the day. It's the wind of the day. It's the spirit of the day. And the Lord comes and Adam and Eve hide. They turn away from God. They cover themselves. They blame others for their sin. And I would encourage us as we come to this Advent season, as the Lord comes to us, that we not do as our first parents, but that we do as the last Adam, and we turn to God. We confess our sins to Him. We ask Him to cover our sins, and not us ourselves. And so, let us do that as we come to the Lord today. I will be reading Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And I'm reading Romans 15, verse 8 through 13. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. As, as, it, as it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you people. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. our sin and confessing our great and eternal need for you. And we thank you, Lord, that you have put it in our hearts for you to be the desire of our hearts. That we know to seek you. us life, it being your 
holiness that lifts us up out of the darkness. We praise you for the great light that has shined and is shining and will shine forevermore. Thank you, Father. We pray for our needs, the needs of our loved ones, the ones in our congregation, uh, the many tumbles and falls, the many infections and diseases, the hurts and pains. We cry out to you and ask that you would touch us for health and for healing and to give us a freedom in our bodies to do the work that you've given us to do. That you would strengthen us and encourage us. And we pray, Father, for vision. For a heart to see Christ among us. And to follow him out into the world. to the resurrected life of Jesus for the people and for your glory. We pray for our broken culture and we ask, Lord, that that which can be redeemed would be redeemed and that which must be put away would be put away. Forward to the day when the trumpet sounds and the brilliance is declared, when Christ returns. We look forward to that day, this second advent. And we pray that we would be faithful to you to that day and in that day. In Christ we pray. in the bride of Christ. This is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God in the church. This is what we've been looking at in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. So if you would turn with me to Revelation chapter 21 and we'll continue where we ended off last week. Remembering that in 20 and 21, we're, this is after the millennial reign of Christ, we're seeing the new heaven and the new earth. The new Jerusalem has come down, and the significant thing about it, regardless of its size and its majesty and its makeup, but the significant thing about the New Jerusalem, the Bride of Christ, is that there's no temple in it because God the Father and the Lamb themselves are the temple. So that's the significant thing in this. You'll remember that we're looking at uh, the New Jerusalem here. In the 22nd chapter, we'll see the new Eden. But now we're looking at the bride of Christ. And we're seeing the glory of God in the bride. So, chapter 21, verse 22. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord... God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need for sun or for the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. 
and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and the lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, we lift your word up to you and we pray that you would enliven our hearts to hear the truth. Take the dullness out and bring it. And bring the Spirit's fullness to us. Amen. So we talked last week about uh, the first um, of these verses. No temple in it. The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Today we look at 23. The city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. This is reflecting back to Isaiah chapter 60, where it says that the Lord will be the enduring light, the everlasting light in the new Jerusalem. And Ezekiel, you think of the Shekinah glory of God in the temple. This is reflective of the actual presence of God. It's difficult for us to, to grasp that, but this Shekinah glory, this cloud of glory that was in the tabernacle and in the temple was real. So we don't experience it like that. We don't see it like that. We can't, we can't walk in and out of it. It was visceral to the people. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, boy, you know, if we could just see it. If we could just, if we could just see it. If Jesus would just show up in his resurrected body one time, that would fix everything. Then everybody would be there. But you know that Jesus answered that question himself. He said, if you don't believe the word of God from the prophets of God, you wouldn't believe it if you saw him. Even if somebody came back from the dead, you wouldn't believe it. That's quite an indictment. It's a dangerous indictment against us. Particularly when we have something inestimably greater, more profound than the Shekinah glory. Unless maybe you don't believe that the Holy Spirit of God does reside in. made a confession of faith that you do believe that through faith in Jesus Christ the Spirit of God resides in you. So we should all be on fire. We should all be ensconced in smoke. <laughs> because the presence of God is in us. Well, that's part of the now and not now conundrum that we live in in this age. The point here is this conundrum has ended after the millennium when God the Father resides viscerally somehow. It is a mystery, but somehow in the bride, in the new Jerusalem, that he's present. That's the light that's shining. There are a million 
in ways to make this a metaphor. And that's usually what preachers do with this. And it's easy to do, and it's, it's, and, and I'm going to do it. But before I do, you've, you've got to lay hold of the reality that this is infinitely more than a metaphor. That this is a new reality that has been brought to us through the death of God on the cross. And through the resurrection of God to life and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we need light. It makes life possible. We're into the metaphor. Light touches the body. There's healing. There's healing in the presence of God. Light touches the emotions. It uplifts the countenance. There's a, um, I forget what the technical term is, but there's a, a syndrome of emotional depletion by not getting enough sunlight. There's one residing inside of you that's infinitely more profound than your grow life. He touches with himself. He touches your emotions. We, we've lost our excuse for our nitpicks and our tantrums. We've lost our excuse. We've lost it in the death of Jesus Christ. Because his spirit abides in you. Light touches the emotions. It uplifts the countenance. Light touches the will. There's a grand courage that comes in the light. When the day dawns and the darkness is gone, our courage is, is strengthened. It becomes more robust. Fear is a thing of the darkness. But remember, the darkness is removed. Now we're in that in-between time. But remember I said last week, we are responsible to be walking in His kingdom because He has established it in this world, in us. Yes, there is a more magnificent kingdom coming. Yes, this isn't anything like what's going to happen, even in the millennium. Nonetheless, we are the bride of Christ. We carry the Spirit of God in us, and we are responsible to Him. To know that our body, our emotions, and our will that's all of us, have been touched, have been transformed, and are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Light touches the mind. This is the pathway out of darkness, out of unbelief into the light. The point is that those who are in Christ, as Christ said, don't walk in darkness. That's right. Well, look at the difference that it makes in verse 24. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So we're talking about the New, uh, the new Jerusalem. That's the it that they're talking about. And we recognize that the it of the light in the new Jerusalem is God and the Lamb. So we could say the nations will walk by His light 
and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into him. Now remember, throughout the 19 chapters that we've been working through in Revelation, the nations have been a problem. They've been unholy wed to Satan. Now, they've been thrown into the lake of fire. All that's gone. No more rebellion. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. No more night, no more darkness, no more sin, no more sea, no more sight for sin or evil to come from. That's all put away. The nations are no longer a curse on the earth. Hallelujah. Now, the nations will walk in the light of God. Now the nations will be a blessing. And look, the kings of the earth, they've been a problem. Right? Their one world government aligned with the Antichrist has been the significant problem in the world. They constantly, the kings are coming together to rebel against God, to lead the people in rebellion against God. Not anymore. Hallelujah. Do you think he knows what he's doing? Do you think he knows how to do what he's doing? If he can change the nations, surely, he can change you. And if he can change the kings, surely he can change us. Now the nations and now the kings are full of the glory of God. His nature and character, that's what defines the nations and the kings now. And their glory belongs in the New Jerusalem. Ah, oh, that's astounding. I'm just not saying it well enough. Or you'd all be dancing. Oh, that's right, we're not dancing. At this meeting. Their glory. Right? The nature and character of the nations belongs in the body of Christ. The nature and character of the kings belongs in the body of Christ. They're holy. They're righteous. They're sanctified. They're right. They're, to use the Old Testament word, they're good. It's right, it's proper, it's correct for them to be the body of Christ. Their glory has been transformed. That's what he's doing in us. You, you think that we're going to be able to live like little goblins down here and then all of a sudden he's just going to fix us? He's in the process of fixing us, of transforming us, so that our glory, our nature and character, will be His, born of His Spirit. And not just some of the time, not just Sunday mornings, or not just when Mom is around, or not just when somebody else is watching, but all the time. Look at verse 25 and 26. In the daytime, for there will no longer be night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Now, two things here. First, no need for gates. Even though they're carved out of a single pearl, even though they're vast and huge to allow great access, even though there's coming and there's going out, there's this great movement, even though they're gates, 
There's no need to keep anything out. The holy city, the bride of Christ, is absolutely pure. And there isn't anything out there that can be brought into her that isn't pure. Because there isn't anything unpure. You've never lived in that. Not even in your sock drawer. <laughs> nothing. Nothing that you've got, you've ever seen pure. Except for one thing. Christ in your heart. Is Christ in your heart? If he is, there's complete, total holiness. There's a holiness in you that dispels all the darkness. There's no yeah, but here at all. It's Christ or it's not. He's that complete. He's that full. He's that sure. There's no need for any kind of governor over you. Christ is the purifier inside of you. It's impossible for us to grasp. Even those of us who grew up in a time when our doors at night were unlocked. What we're looking at here is a totally new humanity. And you guys are the, are the prototype. You're the ones that he's making into the ones who will experience pure holiness. And he wants you to start eating it today. To start living it and thinking it and breathing it today. Holiness is serious to him. And the church has lost it. But we've, we can't let that stop us. We've got to be as serious about holiness as God is. Total new reality. And it already lives inside of you. It's not a different God that's going to show up. It's the same Christ in the new Jerusalem that lives inside of you now. The same one. There's no danger of loss today. In whatever your circumstances are, in Christ, there's no danger of loss. There's no danger of defeat today. In your circumstances, in Christ, there's no possibility of defeat. There's no possibility of invasion today, in Christ. There's no possibility of anybody stealing anything from you in Christ today. Let me in. Let me in. There's no danger. Remember, there's no longer any sea. Remember, the sea is the site of Satan. And Satan's been thrown away. And in the new heaven and the new earth, there's no sea, there's no sight, there's no place for him to come from. There's only pure godliness. There's only pure holiness. And you've got as much as you'll accept today. So that's the first thing in verses 25 and 26. The second thing is everything. Everything is a product of glory and honor. Oh, what a happy day that will be. Oh, what a magnificent thing life will be when that's reality. Everything reflects God's character and nature. Everything is of noble character. I love that word. 
I wish I knew what it meant. Nobility. To, to see a true human being. Well, there is one. His name is? Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. And by faith you say he lives inside of you. Pure, true nobility. Everything reflects God's character and nature. Everything of noble character. Honorable. Every man, every woman, every child. Honorable. Look to Jesus. You won't find it in the halls of power in the ungodly union between humanity and Satan. You won't find it in the entertainment of the ungodly union between the world and Satan. The only place that you'll find it is in the only true honorable human that ever lived. His name is Jesus. So now the contrast. Remember we've talked about how significant the contrasts are in the book of Revelation. And verse 27 comes to us. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and practices lying will ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. No unclean thing. There will be no unclean thing in existence. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that. What does that look like? Talk about a divine economy. Talk about a divine government. Talk about a divine culture, religion. Nothing unholy even exists. Not a thought. Not a deed. It says holiness. And that's what we're called to. God has, through His Spirit, made it possible for us to walk in the light by walking in Christ Jesus. Nothing unclean. It doesn't even exist. We see this already in the New Testament. In the ceremonial, unclean have been removed by the presence of the Holy Spirit in the age. This is what the unclean animals and Cornelius was all about in the book of Acts. It, only the pure remains. And he says, no one that practices abominations and no one who deceives. And these are two sides of the same coin as it was. One is the the action, the doing, practicing abominations. The other is the deceiving. The, the deceit comes from the heart. The, the lie comes from the heart, the, the being, the inside. Both of these are so totally transformed by the glory of God, the character of Christ in us, that, that they don't exist. It's not like you can go to an island somewhere and find them. Find somebody that hasn't been transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. Everybody that doesn't have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that hasn't been filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the light with Christ, is in the lake of fire. And won't be let out. But everyone who has who has bowed their knee to the sovereignty of Christ, the glory of God in Christ, who have come by faith to recognize that they can't, not only can't save themselves, but that they can't even help themselves. 
that we were created by God to be dependent upon God. Nothing in between. No one, no institution, but God to man and man to God. The shocking thing is, this is part of our reality today. Yes, all of the 20 previous chapters must happen. Yes, all of this is on its way to being completed. Yes, we are talking about a time in the future. And yes, there is a literalness to this that is not yet realized. But the Holy Spirit in you either brings the reality of God into you, or you remain guilty of denying the presence of God. Be careful. Be careful when you start rejecting God's grace. Two things happen. The first, when you start rejecting God's grace, the first thing that happens is He stops extending it. There is a point at which your heart becomes so hardened that you can't turn, that you won't turn. And then you are totally sunk. His grace extends. We like to talk about his loving kindness lasts forever. But there is a hardness to the heart. The second thing is, if you continue to reject God's grace, that you finally realize that His grace was your only chance and that it's too late. And this is hopelessness. The great bane of our culture today. Hopelessness. As long as you think that there's something else that you can put in between you and God, or something that you can separate or substitute for God. God will never have his proper place in your life. <clears throat> We've gotten it into our heads that the only thing that's important is for us to get started. To get saved. It's equally important for us to embrace the holiness of God. It's equally important to live in Christ. If we keep coming to crossroads in our context, in our tradition, we call it crisis moments. But it doesn't have to be the way we define a crisis now. It's just a choice. When you come to a choice, and continually choose the world instead of Christ, you produce in yourself a blindness and a hardness that can't see God. Repentance, then, is the call of the day. Repent from our self-will, from our selfishness, Repent from our old nature and turn to Christ for your mind, your emotions, and your will. He's shown us in these verses how his light affects these things, how his light transforms these things. And in that turning with the mind, with the emotions, and the will, we receive from Christ his very own hope and faith and love. And that is the call for the day. Faith, hope, and love. To give yourself to him completely, as the Bible says, and acceptable. 
a good, an acceptable, a good sacrifice. The sacrifice of a sanctified life. If you will, He will give you of Himself as much as you will take. Anywhere you will be willing to go. The song of response today is hymn number 404. Lead on, O King Eternal. There is no king after Jesus. He is the last king. So if you're going to be a follower, you're going to have to follow him. May this be our response. Will you stand with me and let's sing together in number 404. Adorned 